Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today marks the first webinar of our cardiology month. So today, the topic will be update in heart failure. We are very honored to uh, have uh, Dr. Asri Ranga as our speaker, as well as uh, Dr. Dr. Asmi as our chairperson. Uh, Dr. Sri Ranga is a consultant cardiologist in the hospital Sudan and is also currently the deputy head of service uh, of uh, cardiology, whereas uh, Dr. Dr. Asmi is a consultant cardiologist and the clinical director of a heart failure and heart transplant unit in IJN. So without further ado, uh, we would like to welcome uh, our speaker, Dr. Asri. Hi. Hi, Dr. Chan. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be talking here. I'll share screen now. I was just yeah. telling them that uh, I think the roles are reversed. Dr. Asmi is the expert here, not me. I uh, hope uh, you'll bear with me. Should have been me, the chairman, but anyway. Uh, let me share. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, we can see. Yes, yes. Okay, update on heart failure 2021. Hi, guys. Uh, me again from uh, Hospital Sedang, a public hospital. And uh, it's a privilege and honor to speak about this. And uh, it's not easy. The topic is so wide. This is just my new heart center supposed to come up, stuck because of COVID, still stuck. You know, so we wait and see. So this is the progress of heart failure treatment over the years. You know, in the late 60s itself, you had... You know, first heart transplant being done, first total artificial heart, and after that it was silent. Then the, we had some uh, pharmaceutical studies, 1980s, 83s, digoxin diuretics, the DIGH trial was neutral. Then in the 80s and uh, early 90s, ACE inhibitors came into picture. And at that time, we still didn't have, uh, you know, device therapy and so on. So late 90s, Medit mass uh, was the first precursor, so device therapy. And the surgical uh, colleagues followed slowly, you know, uh, there was not much uh, innovation in heart transplant until uh, 2000 and so on when we, uh, you know, ventricular assist devices and so on came into picture. Then we had uh, ARBs coming in, a lot of device uh, coming in. And then now we even see you know, anti-diabetic drugs being used and a parenteral heart failure, which I'm going to touch a bit. So over the years, it's been almost more than 20 years since our first heart failure guidelines came out. And since then, we had four revisions, you know, and um, the latest one is uh, 2019, the fourth edition. It was still lagging behind, if you ask me, because this year there were two uh, revisions uh, internationally, the 2021 uh, consensus uh, expert, we call it ECDP, uh, by the American College of Cardiology and the big gamut of the 2021 ESC guidelines, which was just uh, fresh out of the oven. It's, it's actually mind boggling. And uh, what is the definition of heart failure? Basically, it's simply put, a clinical syndrome due to the disability of the heart to pump blood at a rate to meet the needs of the various organs of the body and its ability to do so only at high feeling pressures. And uh, there are various causes of heart failure. The common ones we see are uh, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, cardiomyopathy. And this etiology sometimes is precipitated by something. So patients are okay, they decompensate when they have acute coronary syndromes, arrhythmias, anemias, infection, even pregnancy and so on. And then when we talk about classification of heart failure. In medical school, we were taught acute heart failure and chronic heart failure, and this still holds true. And then there are var variations. We've got systolic versus diastolic heart failure. We had high output versus low output heart failure, left versus right. But, you know, uh, this is the American College of Cardiology stage A, B, C, D, which I'll be going into detail later. And when you look at functional class, we have this NYJ class one, two, three, four, three, and four, and once heart failure, they're very symptomatic and so on. And although we said we shouldn't put a number to heart failure, EF is a, you know, a poor indicator, but now all our trials, everything are based on ejection fraction, like it or not. So basically we divide into three now, uh, those with the commonly one, the ones we see uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, EF 40% or less. Then we had in the past what they call mid range, this is borderline, we were not sure what to do with them, 41% uh, to 50%. Now we call them the latest one for mid-range has been uh, changed to mildly reduced in the European uh, uh, guidelines, the recent ones. And of course, we have this big gamut of patients, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I'll just mention very briefly on them, not much here. Most drug therapies don't work. So the ones I'm going to talk about today will be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But this will be the only slide where I'll touch on preserved EF. So basically, the fundamental difference here is those with heart failure reduced ejection fraction is a volume overload. You've got increased diastolic pressure, increased diastolic wall stress, chamber enlargement. So you get dilated 
left ventricle dilated cardiomyopathy and so on. As opposed to heart failure with preserved EF, you have a pressure overload, increased systolic pressure, and then you have wall thickening, concentric hypertrophy, restrictive, and so on. And most drugs which we use in reduced heart failure will not work with preserved heart failure. It's a different ball game. There's a lot of classifications for this. I'm not going to touch because uh, the scope of my lecture is different. So coming back to these stages of heart failure in American College of Cardiology, stage A is very simple. Those with risk factors for heart failure, like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, but they do not have uh, any symptoms. So basically, you talk about lifestyle modification and so on. Stage B is asymptomatic uh, left ventricular dysfunction. They have basically, uh, maybe they have previous MI and so on, uh, and the patients are rather uh, asymptomatic. Uh, so they have a structural heart disease. The ones we really see you present to us are type C, stage C, where they have either preserved or reduced heart failure. They come with uh, heart failure symptoms, shortness of breath, dyspnea, ankle swelling, and so on. And I'll touch a bit on stage D later. These are advanced heart failure. Uh, despite optimal treatment, you find that it's, it's, it's really difficult to treat them. And uh, these are the 2016 ESC guidelines. And if you look at this, they talk about patients with, uh, it's a step-based approach. So basically, you start with AC videos, beta blockers, and if they're still symptomatic, you add an MR antagonist, and then you go on. If the EF is still down, most of the time it's down. But if they're symptomatic, you actually go on to replace with ARNI, then you evaluate whether you need to do uh, device therapy and so on, and they talk about evabredin and things like that. But things have been changing now because this takes a long time to do so. And especially the government clinic, it will take you know forever. And patients will be um, not given optimal medication quickly enough. So this is the Malaysian guidelines. And the changes are, well, they are uh, advocating class 1B, first line use of ARNI on top of ARB and ACE if it is available. I know cost is an issue. So that's something we need to play around with. So as, as an alternative conventional ACE, they still talk about stepwise approach to optimize treatment and so on. So this is where I think uh, we need to uh, look at the current evidence and so on. So it's a stepwise approach, as you can see here. And this is the uh, American uh, 2021 uh, ECDP, where they call, they actually advocated a pillar-based approach. If you can see, uh, we talk about four pillars later on, but here, basically, they are almost, uh, there are five pillars. The one, uh, uh, the base is basically RNA-ACE, ARB base with a beta blocker, diuretic agent as needed. And then you talk about SGLT2, sorry, MRA, uh, aldosterone antagonist here, then you talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, and then diuretics I already mentioned. This is usually for black patients where in the, in the West, they use hydrolyzine isosobite. It's not very relevant in our country. And you talk about evaporating in patients already been adequately beta blocked. I mean, they've been beta blocked, but not adequately controlled. So this is the landmark trial state patient heart, uh, reduced heart failure in the last 30 years. As I told you earlier, ACE inhibitors with solve uh, came in, CPS2 and MERIT actually showed uh, emphasis on beta blockers. Then your ARBs came in, uh, you have a uh, real study emphasis and so on. And the paradigm heart failure is one of the game changers. So this is an interesting study looking at 8,442 patients published about seven years ago. And they had actually, this is the study design. They had a six weeks uh, uh, run-in period where subsequently they were randomized to either uh, uh, ARNI, Sacramento-Valsaltan, or Adelopil 10 bd And this is looking at patients with the EF. Initially, it was less than 40%, then they amended to 35%, and mostly two to four patients. So these are sick patients, elevated uh, NT, pro-BNP, and BNPs, and so on. So they looked at this group of patients, and they looked at over a 27-month um, uh, median follow-up. And what's interesting, the primary endpoint was reduced, uh, where it reduced all core, uh, sorry, the primary, and this is all cause mortality. Uh, the, uh, this is one of the uh, only trials in recent years you know, to show this because for a long time we did not see this. So there was 16% reduction in all cause mortality with the number needed to treat only 36. And if you look at the previous trials which showed this was ACE inhibitors, it saw 16% reduction, ARBs, beta, beta blockers 34%, your MRAs. And this is interesting because on top of all this, when you add ARNI, you have a further 16% reduction. So in all-cause uh, mortality. 
and subs that, those were chronic heart failure. Then people started asking, how about acute heart failure? Then subsequently, this was published, a Pioneer Heart Failure Study, uh, and they looked at, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they had 800 plus patients for each group. So basically, uh, this was the, uh, the inclusion criteria that excluded those with cardiogenic shock. And they basically, it is a biomarker trial. They looked at uh, eight weeks, the efficacy of uh, this medication bringing down uh, anti-pro BNP, and at the same time, looking at safety and tolerability. The clinical endpoints were exploratory. Okay, so to see whether we can tolerate this drug in the acute setting because of hyperkalemia and so on. They did show that there was almost a 30% reduction uh, in anti-pro BNP, and this is exploratory here for reduction of uh, events this is over eight week period. So this showed that you can actually tolerate this uh, uh, drug in an acute setting. And this is another proof heart failure where actually they showed uh, reversal of cardiac remodeling. And uh, what I want to show you is uh, there was a 20, 25% of patients, there's a 13% increase in uh, EF at uh, one year. And these were mostly uh, RAS or ACE Navy, Navy patients. So we have a lot of evidence as far as ARNI is concerned. And now, again, reiterating the fact, uh, these are the initial therapies, and this is layered. When we say layered add-on therapies, it's not sequential. We add on as the patient tolerates. So this is the current changes. If you look at it's a four, now this is the ESC, just now was the American College of Cardiology. So it is like a four pillar approach, okay? So no more sequential. So we are talking about, you know, early, uh, but not sequential, as long as the patients are tolerate. So we actually can add all four, four classes of treatment as soon as possible. And uh, we are talking about, you know, over a three to six month period, quickly optimizing the patients uh, with the medication, the pharmacology and so on. I'll talk about a bit of device therapy uh, after this and uh, how we choose our device quickly. So the baseline, uh, the, the mainstay is ACE inhibitor ARNI uh, with the emphasis of an ARNI, uh, beta blockers. Then it comes on MRA, STLT2 inhibitors, loop directives with this fluid retention. And uh, even brain if your beta blockers cannot adequately control. So again, these are talking about stage C heart failure. So uh, I've actually talked about ARNI just now. Only thing ARNI is the preferred running angiotensin antagonist now, class 1B indication, uh, and uh, if uh, cost permit. And then here, I'd just like to show that uh, beta blockers might not be uh, ideal in the initial phases when the patient is in congestion, so you have to wait for that. So don't be in a hurry to start uh, beta blockers in somebody who's very symptomatic and so on, unless you can actually uh, bring them a bit more dry. And then this is talking about aldosterone antagonists. Uh, we talk, the, the ones we commonly have is, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, spinolactone, there's apirinone, there's a newer one, a non-steroidal uh, 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 aldosterone antagonist, and the problem is actually you have to monitor renal function, because when you add ARNI and uh, MRA, there's a potential for uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, so you have to actually uh, monitor this, and also you look at your uh, EGFR uh, of more than uh, 30. And then uh, this is where I'm going to touch a bit more later is SGLT2 inhibitors. I mean, the next uh, exciting uh, group of uh, drugs, because initially they were only uh, meant for diabetic patients. Then we found that one of the serendipitous uh, effects is actually they reduce heart failure of hospitalization. So if you initiate in those with EGFR more than 30, uh, the common ones usually use is DAPA and also EMPA glyphosine. And uh, this is uh, in regards to HLT2 inhibitors. So in the empire rec we had a 35% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. In the canaglyphosin, in the canvas study, 33%. And declared TB58 was 27%. This is a diabetic subgroup. So the subsequently, I show you even in non-diabetics, it tends to work. And in empire it also reduces cardiovascular uh, death, CV death, and so on. So now, even the diabetic guidelines have followed suit. So they don't talk about sequential anymore. They talk about actually adding uh, in those with high ASCVD, arthroscopic uh, cardiovascular disease or high CV risk straight away starting LCLT2 inhibitors or uh, 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 GLP-1 RA uh, agonist as per leader's trial. And of course, uh, we also combine with metformin. The rest comes in later. So the choice of drug depends on the CVD. So the, the endocrinologist also following. So this is a DAPA heart failure uh, uh, trial where the primary endpoint of CV death and the recurrent hospitalization was met uh, uh, in this highly significant. This is actually those who reduce heart failure, not necessarily diabetic patients. And uh, again, uh, looking at uh, patients, uh, either the diabetic or non-diabetic, 
the endpoints actually met in, uh, in this group of patients. And this is the emperor reduced. Same thing we see again, uh, reduction in uh, primary endpoints, significant reduction uh, in uh, this group of patients uh, for heart failure. So now technically it's become a heart failure drug. So it's actually cheaper than uh, Entresto so, or Arni. So uh, in some ways uh, it, it plays in the cost. I mean, not so much cheaper because the dose, uh, you can take half the dose and so on. So these are the, the current uh, advances in guidelines. As I mentioned, SGLT2 inhibitors, just no doubt and then you're talking about the uh, RNE is a class 2A to be used as your first line now. We also are looking now at iron deficiency. So you should consider aggressive testing of patients for anemia and correcting iron deficiency will reduce symptoms and reduce hospitalizations as a class 2A indication in the new guidelines. So this is something we're also looking at IV, uh, iron uh, uh, supplementation and so on. So again, as a summary, the four pillars of heart failure changed from the previous guidelines now. So you're looking at RNA beta blockers, uh, MRA, LCLT2 inhibitors, you can all start together, but uh, and plus minus uh, your diuretics, and then try to optimize the patients uh, quickly uh, as, you, as you see them in the clinic. And uh, it's, it's not only the Americans have followed. So this is the Canadian uh, uh, Cardiovascular Society. They also came up with the same uh, guidelines now. It's a pillar-based approach, four pillars. And they talk about ARNI, beta blockers, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitors. And if you see at uh, the evolution of guidelines since 2016, uh, with the ESC first and ACC expert consensus, you can see in 2020, the French, the Spanish have followed suit. This year, the Greeks have also come on board with Canadians. I think, uh, you know, the next guidelines, uh, in Malaysia, we will actually uh, follow suit and or, we're already doing that actually. And again, uh, this is a summary of just now the four pillar approach. Once they are optimized, then we look at whether we can initiate, they need to initiate device therapy or not. If the patient is symptomatic, then we look at the ejection fraction, 35% or less. And if the QRS is uh, usually more than 130 is where we actually go for uh, CRTP or set. There are two types of device. One is CRTP, is a cardiac risk synchronization therapy. Another one is ICD, more to prevent uh, VT and VF shots and sudden cardiac deaths. And of course, we can combine uh, both of them together. But in Malaysia at the moment, as far as KKM is concerned, we do not approve uh, for primary prevention, uh, uh, ICD for primary prevention, because cost is just very prohibitive, as you know. And uh, a bit on device therapy again. Uh, so first thing, you must make sure they're, med they're optimized medically. So medical treatment must be optimized. Don't go and jump to a CRTP uh, unless they got BT and so on. Then there's indication for uh, ICD. And then because if you combine ICD and CRTP, the cost of the, the device is double. It's almost 80,000 plus. If it's just ICD, you can get 35, 40,000, half of the price. And they are actually uh, symptomatic. And YJ class 2 to 4, despite opti optimal medical therapy, and the QRS duration, the magic figures widen QRS. So anybody with heart failure, always make sure you have a look at the ECG. The most important thing, document this down when you see the patient for the first time. And then this is the EF, the magic figure we look at. So CRT uh, has been beneficial from 2000 to 2010. We had multiple trials, care heart failure companion. Uh, the, the last, so you got more than 7,000 patients studied if you follow the proper guidelines. So if you have, to, for maximum benefit, you need those less than 35% EF uh, and widened QRS. And this is the improvement in the primary endpoints in all these uh, major trials, which were done major CRT clinical trials. And uh, so then the other things come in is sudden cardiac death. So this is looking at some of the trials where patients died suddenly and more than 50% actually have sudden cardiac death. You know? So uh, even these are mortalities in the trials I've seen. So I know this, there is a cell for a primary prevention in this group, but cost is an issue, but I'll show you the current guidelines, what they show. Uh, and this is the, uh, in the, uh, the merit mass, the overall uh, ethnic uh, drug uh, deaths, which have been prevented by putting the ICD in. So now this is, uh, is not contested anymore, you know, uh, but you must make sure that patients are still on medical treatment. So how it works is uh, when the ICD detects VT, it goes into ATP or anti technical depacing. If this fails, most of the time it's successful. If this fails, then it'll deliver a shock. And then subsequently the patient will come to the hospital, we'll see how. But a lot of things are not telling you. Sometimes you go into ICD storm, they just keep on firing. Then the EP guys have to go in and do complex VT ablation. 
it can be very, very messy, this group of patients. So this is the guidelines I want to show you. So primary prevention ICD, the 2016 was class one, but now they have uh, downgraded it to class 2A. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is something uh, we are also following in uh, KKM all the while uh, because we can't exhaust someone. So it's now class 2A, no more class one uh, for primary prevention uh, in this heart failure group. And again, uh, from class one, even in symptomatic patients, uh, it's been uh, downgraded to class 2A uh, in this group of patients. And uh, this is something else, atrial, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation in heart failure is a difficult subset to treat. And uh, even with beta blockers, the mortality is not reduced. They are a bit a different animal. And this is castle AF. So this is catheter ablation for AF. Finally, there's a study in 2018, and uh, they looked at uh, 363 patients, if I'm not mistaken, and they had a 16.1% uh, reduction in the endpoints driven by a reduction in that. This is very interesting. And since then, AF uh, ablation has gone a long way. And now they can actually, uh, they have a cryotherapy, cryo balloon and so on. They can do the procedure much quicker in those days when the, the Dr. Razali first started, it used to take more than four or five hours. I think now he's one of the highest uh, high volume operators in the country. So AF ablation, I believe in heart failure, the proper patients is here to stay, especially if you've got proximal atrial fibrillation and so on. Then comes to this about um, heart failure clinics. Do we need heart failure clinics and so on? So this is actually another journey. In the last five years, almost all large hospitals, even KKM, even non-cardiac hospitals like HKL and so on have started heart failure clinics. And it is actually a, a seamless so-called journey. It starts from you know, outpatient or inpatient. So we find that heart failure clinics with multidisciplinary approach uh, really optimizes the treatment for patients much faster and is better, especially in Dalman clinics when your appointments are six months down the line with heart failure. You can even, you don't need to have to see, don't need to see the uh, doctors all the time. You can see the nurses, the counseling and so on within two weeks, four weeks of discharge. This is the most important time when we need to see patients' heart failure. You need to know the dry weight, uh, how to guide them and so on. Because if you lose that, you see the patient in six months, it's back to square one again. And this is guideline based now. It started with uh, 2013, 2016, and now even with uh, 2021, it's a 1A uh, indication for you to have a multidisciplinary care program heart failure. It can be advanced heart failure. It can be, you know, uh, uh, even uh, simple types of heart failure patients who get recurrent admissions and so on. So what do we mean by advanced heart failure? The current guidelines actually dictate, uh, they actually have a criteria for that. So you have to have all these four uh, uh, criteria fulfilled, severe persistent symptoms most of the time. You're talking about NYJ class three to four. And then uh, it is actually uh, objectively, you can actually uh, uh, characterize this by EF is less than 30%, IRV failure, persistently high, BNP or NT pro BNPs and so on. Then they have uh, at least more than one hospitalization in the year, impact a six minute walk test and so on. So with this, if you fulfill all of this, then you're looking at somebody, you can call advanced heart failure. This is something which I want to um, get you guys uh, uh, accustomed to. Uh, this is more for advanced heart failure and centers like IGN. So Intermax is, is, is Interagency Registry for Mechanical Assisted Security Support. So there are actually seven uh, categories of patients inside here. So basically category one to four, are the ones who are very sick. So category one, cardiogenic shock, you're talking about somebody who's going to suck in the next few hours if you don't do something. Category two, somebody with inotropes, got a few days and so on. So this is how you choose your uh, advanced device uh, support, where I'll show you briefly ECMO, ECLS, uh, and also LWET. So this is how we, if you have somebody in seven, then uh, class seven, maybe they can hold on with just medication first. So this is something like a bridge to uh, transplantation. So this is actually uh, shown in the current uh, guidelines. So these are the peculiar mechanical support options available. Unfortunately, in most government cardiac centers, we don't have intraortic balloon pump. Impella is, 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 is something we're talking about, but the cost is, is quite prohibitive. It's 100,000 ringgit per use, and you just, uh, it's like one catheter single use, you throw away. And uh, we have uh, ECMO in a few centers, maybe five centers in Malaysia, maybe three uses it more. And then tandem heart is only done in one center in Malaysia, that is uh, IGN. I will go into this uh, a bit more later. 
So I will I will touch on ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So basically uses uh, it actually exchange your gas and also as a pump to actually circulate. So somebody on ECMO basically you don't even have to do CPR with the heart stops VA ECMO that is you know uh, but uh, even his lungs will get uh, oxygen and so on but usually we'll still ventilate this patient. So it's constant oxygenator in a pump. There have been many generations. This is a third generation latest. It costs half a million, and uh, the consumables cost thirty thousand. But that is not it. The thing is, you need an experienced team, a professionist, everything to run this. Uh, very few places they can do that. And ECMO basically got a VV ECMO, VV ECMO. There are many variations to this. But basically, you put in uh, uh, two cannulas. You, you suck in from the IVC and you come back into the uh, right atrium, oxygenated blood. Uh, this is more for uh, primary, primary indications, you no know, bad lungs, like currently like COVID and so on, maybe you can use this. But for cardio, we're talking about VA ECMO, where the blood is actually taken from the inferior vena cover and actually pump into the femoral artery. So this is more relevant for uh, cardiac patients. And if even the heart stops, it's not a problem because this will actually take over support. But this is uh, quite cum uh, cumbersome to put in. You need a lot of expertise to do this. At the moment, very few centers do that. Even in Sedang, it's not our cardiology, but mostly it's the cardiac NS and so on. But we are looking at this. If you want to be a shock center, this is where we grow. I think IGN has extensive use of this. So this is tandem heart uh, tree, heart made tree. So this is a left ventricle assist device. So this is a very interesting uh, pump like where the surgeon has to operate the patient. It's a two to three hour operation. And uh, in IGN, I know that Dr. Nazri does this. And uh, they have done, IGN is the only center in Malaysia to have done this. They have done about 32 cases over the last, I think, 10 years or something like that. And they've level on their follow-up. The, the, the survival is like 80% at one year. They got good long-term survival. So in the past, this was bridged to a transplant. But now it's a destination also for some group of patients. So you can see where they put in the packs and so on. It costs almost half a million ringgit. I think uh, about 400,000 plus. And uh, you have two batteries, the patient can ambulate and so on, but you need to anticoagulate the patients. Sometimes we worry about infections and so on. And uh, this group of patients actually uh, do well uh, in a sense, like, you know, even with this, but uh, this is something which is like emerging. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, at the moment, uh, the, the expertise for this is in Asia. And I think in the long-term maintenance, it costs almost a million to manage the patient and so on. So another thing which I want to tell you is palliation. And most of us disregard this, you know, and it's something uh, which we are looking at. I think US, this is becoming number one now. So if somebody who has, uh, you know, you cannot uh, refer heart transplantation and so on, cardiac cachexia, got multi-organ failure, or you got end-stage uh, renal disease and so on, dialysis, uh, poor social support and so on, is something you need to actually palliate uh, and talk to the patient, especially think the life, uh, so that you don't waste uh, money on you know expensive device therapy and so on, and you are not going anywhere. So I think this is something very important we are looking at. And uh, I will talk a bit here and there. I can't cover everything, but micro regurgitation heart failure has recently been given a boost. Uh, so basically, somebody with uh, micro regurgitation usually is due to secondary micro regurgitation. They do actually worse if they got heart failure. For them, the cutoff EF is 60%. Anything less than 60% is impact. So if they have a need for coronary revest, if they have blockages, the first thing you should do is consider surgery. So it's a heart team discussion. But if the heart team declines and so on uh, in this group of patients, now we have what we call percutaneous ways of doing this. This is a mitra clip, also at the moment only done in IGN. And uh, it is technically very demanding. It's 100,000 ringgit at least. And the COAP trial looked at 300, uh, 600 plus patients. And they actually showed that uh, in the right group of patients with EF 20 to 50%, uh, it actually decreases uh, heart failure admissions and so on at uh, one year. If I'm not mistaken, one year. One year, I think. Uh, yeah, I think. And then, uh, sorry, I think 24 months. 24 months. So. This is something which is uh, promising. I think it's going to, because MR is much more common than aortic stenosis and so on. Then the other thing I want to talk about is, uh, sorry, is cardiac amyloidosis. The reason I touch on this is because there's treatment available now. So if you have somebody with uh, having a heart failure, sometimes the EF does not necessarily need to be poor. They've got risk free heart failure, and but there's actually LV hypertrophy and so on. There's something you need to think about. Uh, and then you look at the red flags. If you've got red flags, any of these red flags in this patient, uh, multi-organ involvement and so on, then you have to think of this. You have to send off your usual free light chain assays, serum urine electrophoresis, P3 
pivotal here is uh, cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI can be almost pathognomonic of uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and also you can use PET scan to diagnose this. So if you have, once you diagnose amyloidosis, then you need to do various tests and so on to see whether they are actually uh, transthyretin uh, amyloidosis. So if it's trans, uh, transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, then there is medication called Tafamidis by Pfizer, either for the hereditary or the wild type to actually treat this group of patients. The other medications also, uh, like the IV patisserin, uh, sub, uh, it's, it's RNA-based therapy, and uh, subcut inotacin is an oligonucleotide sense uh, treatment, but those are those with polyneuropathy. I don't think that's available in Malaysia. I think in, in Sedan, we have two patients uh, with transcytin amyloidosis under our follow-up. I think IGN is a lot more patients like this. Okay, next thing is uh, one of my favorite topics, the genetics in heart failure. So uh, I think this is actually very neglected because in the past, the technology was not there. But now technology has jumped leaps and bounds. If you look at it, there's so many things in cardiology which is affected by genetics. So when you talk about whole groups, you're talking about that, the cardiomyopathies, number one. Number two is familial hypercholesterolemia. Number three, arrhythmias. There's so many arrhythmias, you know, sodium channel, uh, channelopathies and so on. Then now even congenital heart disease. So what has changed in the last 10 years, we have what we call next generation sequencing, NGS, and whole exome sequencing, even whole genome sequencing. So with this, you can do multiple genes. In the past, just to do one gene will cost you thousands. Now I'll show you later some of the things we did. Multiple genes, you can just do it uh, quite fast. I mean, the actual lab, if you said overseas, it'll take still one month but they can get it done at a reasonable price. And there's so much uh, information in the internet. So when you have this, you have to go into the NCBI, uh, Human Genome Resources. They have many databases where you can actually compare. The clean one is one of the common ones which I use. And then when you look at uh, the genes, what they do is, for example, this cardiomyopathy, these are the top 10 genes in the cardiomyopathy. You can see, like the form. for example, titan is one of the large ones. So you look at the, myo the cardiac muscle itself, so this is where the proteins are actually encoded. So the desmoplakin, if you have any uh, abnormalities here, you have actually what we call uh, ARVC, uh, ARVD, air proteinic right ventricle dysplasia. A TTN is more for titan, is more for dietary cardiomyopathies. And then we have myosin heavy chain and troponin T, troponin I, genes for hokum. So this is how they actually affect the patient. So this is something very interesting. But one thing I have to caution you, uh, is that uh, this? Is, we have to work in tandem with the geneticists. I'm trying to link up in HKL and so on. And uh, you have to really counsel the patient because the ramifications are quite a lot as far as insurance is concerned, psychological, because some of them can have the genes, but they have a genotype, but no phenotype. So phenotype negative. So we call it cascade screening when you screen the patient's family. If they can't afford, we just do phenotypical uh, screening with echoes and so on. But the counseling is very important because this is like once you have it, it's lifelong. And then not everybody will manifest and some of them manifest, but do not have the gene. And uh, so it's very important to really counsel the patient before you do this uh, treatment. This is one example of a patient we did. So this is the panel on the left. Uh, we sent it to invite a company overseas. It's very easy, just a sliver and so on. It costs about 250 USD uh, to do and to send with the FedEx and so on. They have everything uh, prepared. It costs another 50 USD. So within 300 USD, 1,200 ringgit, you can get this done. You get the results in one month. Uh, so this patient from Malacca, we presented a whole to us, uh, had a TNNI 3 gene abnormality. So here is pathogenic uh, variant. So this, uh, so we are going to screen his family and so on. So now we can put something, uh, a genetic, uh, you know, identifier to his problem and so on. So this is troponin, uh, affects the troponin, uh, uh, sorry, your top uh, eye muscles uh, molecule. So this is also important when you've got a variant of uh, pathogenic variant. The problem starts when you have, uh, uh, what you call it, a variant of unknown significance, VUS. So how to go about this and so on. So work together with the geneticist to properly identify. Hopefully in the future, we'll have treatment for this. So in conclusion, uh, heart failure reduce EF. There are now four class of drugs which we can actually use, and we are actually advocating a pillar-based approach now. And up titration should occur, depending on the patient's ability, within three to six months to actually get to the initial, uh, to optimize the patient, and also uh, with a heart failure clinic setting, this will help. Additional therapies that improve outcomes should be considered, uh, CRTD, ICDs, and so on, maybe other drug therapies, specific uh, etiology should be sought. And at once, at, at once heart failure, 
uh, you will need uh, heart failure specialist management and you must know where to refer uh, these type of cases. And thank you. That's all. Maybe I finish a bit faster. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri Ranga. I think in an excellent presentation. Um, I think you know we you know we'll we'll have about twenty five minutes to discuss a few questions, and I think we will go through some of your lectures that you actually mentioned. I think three. I think you know you you covered all aspects of heart failure. Not easy, isn't it? In half an hour, right? I think a lot of advances. You know, a lot of technology has you know including. Uh, the mitral clip for patients with functional MR. So we also have embarked that, you know, a few years ago in IGN and we're still doing it. So, so far we, we're, we're okay in terms of we're in the right track for this kind of patients. But I think to start off, uh, so yeah, I think, you know, the issue now is number one is that making the diagnosis of patients with heart failure. So I think, um, so you have mentioned about the three classification, right? So we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So I think that one is clear cut, you know, ejection fraction of less than 40%. Heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction between sort of like 40 to 50%, right? And of course, the other thing that is emerging is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it's really, I think, you know, just to get everybody in, you know, in the same, you know, mindset, you know, what is your opinion in terms of diagnosing heart failure with preserve? I know you didn't cover this, but just, you know, I think we just briefly mentioned it for, you know, for five minutes, just, you know, in terms of the diagnosis, how do you think is, you know, is it difficult to manage, uh, to, to diagnose patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Yeah, I think a uh, good question. I think in the past, uh, we just went by, you know, diastolic dysfunction and yep. so on, but now we find that uh, there's a lot more to it because, you uh, most of the time we just say that, you know, most of the time we will be alerted by symptoms. And mm -hmm. what we know by the symptoms of preserved heart failure and uh, reduced heart failure is almost similar. So yeah. the initial ones is symptomology and so on. And then we do your basic ECG, chest x-rays and so on, your basic echoes. I think this is something we can actually look and then it will actually guide us uh, towards, uh, towards this. And subsequently, uh, there, there, are, there are two classifications people can use. I think one is the Mayo one, and the other one is, I think the simpler one will be the, not simpler, la, but the, the ESC uh, yeah. heart uh, diastolic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, preserve heart failure criteria. So after that, then you go more detail. You try to look for, uh, uh, in a sense that more into diastolic uh, 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 heart failure, you look at tissue Doppler, E prime levels, E over E prime ratio, yeah. uh, is it more than 15? Uh, uh, certain things like that. And also you look at the cardiac biomarkers. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, so you're looking at the anti pro BNP and the BNP. So basically for AF, then you have to, the, the level is like anti pro BNP more than 660. If you do not, uh, it's three times more than normal, then these are your cutoffs. So when you have this, then you can, maybe you can actually stop there and say that um, this is uh heart preserve uh, patient having preserved heart failure. But mm -hmm. if they are inconclusive, then you have to go into more invasive tests. Yeah. And this you're talking about the uh, uh, right heart catheterization. Yeah. And also during uh, doing the tissue Doppler and so on, you can actually exercise the patient and see whether there is any uh, deterioration in his uh, uh, tissue Doppler uh, uh, readings and so on. Yeah. Or uh, what is your baseline? For example, you look at uh, uh, primary wage pressure, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's uh, more than 50, then you can actually say it is already preserved heart failure. If no, then you exercise them, see whether it goes up to 25 or more. Yep. So once you have determined that, then you look for etiology. So there here, cardiac MRI comes in. Uh, sometimes like, sometimes you might even pick up amyloidosis and so on. Genetic right. studies come in. So there's a long cascade of things. So, uh, But the, the problem is, at the moment, uh, there's not much for treatment as far as drugs are concerned for preserved yeah. heart failure. Yeah. But only if you find specific etiologies like amyloidosis or something like that, then you can treat them. Uh, then it's, uh, you know, you, you basically you say treat underlying cause. Yeah. It can be hypertension, simple as that. It can be even ischemia, coronary artery disease can also cause that. So you look for other causes and so on. That's my point. Yeah. So what, what do you think that does mean? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, the, the issue now is, you know, when we, you know, when we perform an echocardiogram, we suspect this patient of heart failure, 
you know, and then if the ejection fraction is more than 50%, some people say, oh, this is not heart failure. And I think that has to change now, you know, because we do know that, you know, there is a category of heart failure with reserve ejection fraction. They are very symptomatic. They are more common in females, you know, elderly, uh, elderly patients with atrial fibrillation and hypertension. Um, and, uh, and they are very symptomatic and the outcome is also quite poor. And it is quite similar in terms of the outcome in patients similar to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So I think making the diagnosis or high index of suspicion is important. I think, you know, just to you know, mention to everyone, uh, treatment as what Dr. Sriranga has mentioned, very limited. You know, however, I think, you know, they are emerging, you know, MPA reduced, you know, SGLT2 inhibitor, you know, and MPA preserved, sorry, MPA preserved, you know, actually, you know, shown that there are benefit, you know, in patients with heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. So I think that is to clear up. So we have heart failure with reduced, heart failure with mildly reduced, and heart failure with preserved, yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, yeah. just to add on, I think uh, there's also Paragon heart failure, which yeah. actually showed yeah. uh, halfway there, halfway here. Yep. So in the end, they say that anybody 57% and below EF, then they might benefit. So those with this mildly reduced ejection fraction, they seems to be the, the same drugs which actually treat reduced heart failure seem to work. Yep. But here, it's I, I think it's a mixture. You're yep. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, okay. Sri, I think you 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 talk about, you know, a, you know, a few trials with regard to um, the use of army, isn't it? Just now, I think you know, one of the question from, you know, from the audience is what is the washout period uh, when we change, you know, patients from, you know, ACE or ARB to Entresto? Um, I think maybe if you want to change, uh, because Entresto or ARNI, you know, contains subcubitral and Valsartan is an ARB. So if you want to change from ARB to Entresto or subcubitral Valsartan, then there is no washout period, isn't it? So you can, yeah. you know, yeah. you can just change it straight away. But if you yeah. do want to change from ACE inhibitor to ARB, you need a 36 hours washout period mm -hmm. before you start yeah. uh, sacrobitrial valsartan or encresto. Um, you know, issue is, you know, in this, you know, cases is because sometimes what I tell my patient is to stop for two days because 36 hours is quite difficult, isn't it? So I will say, yeah. you know, stop it yeah. for two days, you know, of your ACE inhibitor and re, you know, and start the encresto after two days. Um, is that something that you do, Sri? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I thought you're, you're absolutely right. And yeah. uh, okay. The, the, the other thing for people to suggest ARNI as the first line now, because there are some studies which show that if you start ARNI as the first line compared to you're switching over to ARNI, uh, as, far, as far as cardiac remodeling and so on, maybe the effects are, are, are better. Right? Yep. But cost, cost is an issue. Like, that's what I want to remind everybody. Yeah. yeah. And Sri, just now you, you mentioned about you know, the, the four pillars of treatment, right? And then in terms of the four pillars of treatment, you mentioned about early uh, parallel approach. So, you know, can you guide us in terms of, you know, how do you use this? How do you start, you know, you know, the RAS blocker, ACE inhibitor or SGLT2 inhibitor or, you know, beta blockers, NMRA, you know, because it's easier if, you know, the previous recommendation is a stepwise approach. You start with this, mm -hmm. this, this, this. But now mm -hmm. it's getting a little bit more confusing. So we are given four different class of drug med medications. We need to start it as early as possible. We need to at least start them within three months, which is a recommendation. Yeah. But is there a guide that you can help us? Okay, everyone here. I I am not so sure in a sense that, I mean, guidelines are guidelines. Yeah. And I still worry about starting all like, you know, you're cooking a nasi, I mean, you know, me goring or something, put everything at one go during the admission. I think that'll be difficult. Yeah. You know that these medications like, for example, ani and so on can cause hyperkalemia and things like that. You wouldn't want to jump and start MRA on the first, on the same admission maybe, you yeah. know. And if they, so you should, usually I'll start diuretics with the, uh, with uh, with the Arni or or or, or Ace, yeah. and then I will see how's the potassium like, how's the patient is behaving, and so on. Because when you diary somebody, you can have a lot of uh, fluid changes and so on. It actually makes uh, hyperkalemia worse if you actually add on uh, uh, MRA at the same sitting. So maybe after that, once a discharge, I'll see the patient back within two to four weeks. Then to actually add on. Uh, uh, MRA, for example, uh, you know, spironolactone and beta blocks is the same thing. If the patient okay. is in the ward, it gets better towards the end. Maybe I'll give them a chicken dose or a smaller 1.25 bicyproloid, for example. So this is how I so-called start and introduce. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Dato? Yeah, I guess I think, you know, you rightly say, I think it's more individualized now, isn't it? So we are given, you know, an opportunity to, to start all four, you know, and you as a physician should decide. 
So let's say, for example, you know, in somebody who has hypotension, then maybe you start, you know, you avoid, you know, the RAS blocker to begin with. You can start with an SGLT2 inhibitor because you know SGLT2 inhibitor, DAPA and MPA doesn't reduce the blood pressure. You know, and also MRA, you know, there is also a very, very modest reduction in the blood pressure. So you can start them, you know, with these two first. And, you know, and then you can, you know, add, you know, so for example, the RAS blocker and the beta blockers later on. But in patients with, you know, for example, you know, who has, you know, severe hyperkalemia renal impairment, then you have to individualize them. So I think, you know, the idea is, you know, to give the physician, everyone here, you know, the responsibility of deciding which are out of these four to start rather than, you know, telling everyone, oh, you start ACE first, beta blockers first, you know, this and that. So I think in a way, in my opinion, it's actually easier to handle, you know, because I can individualize this patient. So this patient who has some renal impairment, so maybe I will have to be very careful with MRA, you know, if I'm afraid of, you know, hyperkalemia in this type of patients, and then I can add SGLT2 inhibitor. I think Dr. Sri mentioned just now, the cutoff for patients for SGLT2 inhibitor, for example, DAPA, the EGFR has to be more than 30, the MPA, the EGFR has to be more than 20. So, you know, you can use, you know, in patients who have severe, you know, CKD, you know, so I think that's a very interesting approach. Isn't it? Actually, these are very new, right? I think this is a, something very new that I think everybody needs to, you know, to, you know, to understand and be able to, you know, cope and manage patients with heart failure. So, okay, I think there's a few questions about hypotension and heart failure. Actually, I think, you know, we're going into this. So, I think the second question is, um, a patient with ejection fraction of 20% hypotension requiring low dose inotropes cannot or difficult to win off inotropes and already, already rule out other diagnoses, you know, what is your approach with this kind of patients and do you accept lower BP uh, or do you refer to cardio? Yeah. So Sri, do you, you, know, do you see these cases a lot in your clinical practice? I mean, we do see these cases, <laughs> but hopefully not a lot because, mm. uh, I mean, if they come in with, you know, an acute coronary syndrome, you know, uh, MI or something like that, we know something to treat. But the cases are like what you mentioned, who come in just with chronic heart failure, these are the group which do very bad, badly, you know, because yeah. your hands are tied, you can actually give things like ACE, RNAs and so on, which you know will work. Even maybe beta blockers, you are reduced to things like, you know, Evabradine, SGLT2 inhibitors now. And uh, the thing is, uh, 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 I, I know that at once you, you need to refer to somebody in uh, you know an advanced heart failure test center. Yeah. Uh, I have not personally put patients on long term inotropes. I know those which are, you know uh, those which do transplant and so on, put them long term inotropes and things like that. These are the ones which I showed you the intermax and so on. He yeah. goes into maybe you know intermax two, three, or four. Yeah. So these are our cases. You have to call that to Azmi Yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, Sri, I think this is a, you know, a classic case that you need to refer to cardio, right? I think tertiary center. So I think this is, a, you know, when you look at this ejection fraction of 20%, hypotension, uh, unable to win off inotropes, you're talking about intermax class 3, you know, stable and inotropes or intermax class 2, you know, sliding down with inotropes. So these are the ones that you do need to refer. Uh, usually when you refer to uh, patients to, you know, to advanced treatment, then we will initially consider, uh, you know, ECMO is what Dr. Sriraga has mentioned. And then, you know, of course, in the interim of that, then we have to consider uh, patients with left ventricular assist device LVAT. However, you know, during that approach, if we feel that the patient is not suitable uh, for any of this advanced therapy uh, because of the risk involved or because of poor comorbidities, then we can consider on a long-term long -term inotropes. Uh, we have that program here in IGN3, you know, because there are some patients who are benefit because we know that we cannot win off the inotropes and they are not suitable for any advanced therapy. So we actually discharge them with a pump uh, with a low-dose inotrope. So we have that in place in IGN. Not that many cases, of course, you know, because, you know, we try to, you know, as much as possible to keep them comfortable, you know, rather than anything. So, uh, the other yeah, this thing is, is this, yeah. Sorry, this is a special pump where they can uh, easy for the patient to handle. Yes, yeah, yeah. There are smaller pumps that is mobile. They can put it in a small bag that can, they can bring around everywhere. And the only thing is the challenge is you need a long term. Um, IV line, you know, so usually we, we put in line and, and of course they need somebody to be at home to monitor and to actually change the, the inotropes to be able to, to do it at home. Yeah, so we have this in place. So it's a, it's a good way of, in a, in a way to discharge patient and, and to have some quality of life, you know, before, you know, end of life really.
Yeah. Okay. So another question is in a patient with a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction with a low BP, what is your best strategy to optimize the anti failure? And I think this is maybe in a chronic stable heart failure, low BP three. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you mentioned this just now, what yeah. to do and things like that. But uh, of course, uh, it's actually a dicey uh, trial and error in a sense if you want to use, uh, but most of the time we will not use, uh, you know, uh, ACE inhibitors so initially, but we see how is the patient. Yep. Sometimes we might uh, start on very, very low doses and see how he responds. And I yep. think it's very important to look at the prior blood pressure. What was his blood pressure before? Yep. So if his blood pressure was already low to begin with, then I'm not so worried. But yep. if it's somebody hypertensive and so on, uh, then it will become a more difficult. And now we have SGL. The only things I yep. can think of heart BP neutral, uh, evabradin and SGLT2 inhibitors, you know. The rest all will play into that. So it's like, uh, again, uh, you have to individualize uh, each patient. Uh, yeah. So those are yeah. the things. Yeah, thanks, Ria. I think uh, I completely agree with you. I think the other thing is a low BP is really subjective, isn't it? You know, so, you know, some patients can, you know, go around with a systolic pressure of about 88 or 90, for example, no symptoms, you know, preserve renal function, you know, and in that cases, I wouldn't consider it's low, you know, so I think it's also depending on the patient. So don't be scared to introduce treatment and see how they are, you know, because uh, of course, if their patients are symptomatic with postural hypertension, you know, with a low BP, then you need to, you know, at least cut down on their anti failure therapy. But then as what Dr. Sri Ranga has mentioned, you have choices now, SGLT2 inhibitor doesn't reduce the blood pressure, you can initiate that first. You know, and when you stabilize the patient, maybe the blood pressure is improved, then you can start a very, very low dose of beta blockers, of, of ARNI, you know, and in fact, you know, I, you know, some of my patients are on ARNI, um, Sacubitri, Valsaltan, and Tresto, 25 milligrams daily, you know, which, you know, I don't know whether it's treating the patient or treating me, you know, but then in fact, I think what I would do is I would try my best to be, you know, to, to have all these patients on very, very minimum treatment in hope that when they kind of recover, their blood pressure improve, then you can actually optimize and increase their, their treatment appropriately. But Sri, I think, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. about limitation of use, um, you know, ARNI in, you know, in the government setting, you know, MOH setting, your experience wise, you know, roughly in your clinical setting, how many percentage of patients were on ARNI? If you ask me, not enough. Not <laughs> enough, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, our, our quota is very limited. To tell you mm. frankly, it's, mm. it's a fight. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we have only now managed to get about 100 plus patients yeah. uh, on, on, on uh, ARNI and Trestor. Mm. And they are actually a good, uh, there's a sizable number actually by. Mm. Even those who I thought were poor are willing to buy interest because they say with that they can actually go to work and earn more. Yeah, you know. So it's very it's 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 a uh I, it's a life. I mean, eye changer for me because I've seen patients who are very bad symptomatically, almost like transplant this thing coming out of it. And I've I've also seen those audio device therapy on Arni, and then you find that the device actually doesn't fire anymore. There's less VT. Mm. There's this uh you know reverse remodeling happening. Yeah. So it is a miracle drug actually, if you ask me. Yeah, um, I think it's quite sad that it is quite expensive, isn't it? I think in IGN, we have the, you know, the opportunity to use it a little bit more. So, you know, and now in terms of the guidelines, you know, in terms of RAS blocker, ARNI is first. And you can introduce it as, you know, after the patient, you know, had a decomposition heart failure in the hospital, you can introduce them in the hospital, or you can actually start them in clinic when they're a bit more stable. So in a way, yeah. I think, you know, I would encourage the, the use of RNA, you know, in, you know, in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection. So for me, it is the number one drug I'm trying, fighting for to yeah. increase the quota and so on. But the only good thing is SGLT2 inhibitors are not cheap either. Yep. But, you know, giving 10 milligrams and so on, uh, it is a cheaper version of, uh, uh, you know, compared to Entresto, it is less, you know, less expensive in that sense. So yeah. hopefully we can reach out to this group of patients. Yeah. Uh, the next question is about the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who has a low systolic BP. I think we've gone through this, 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 you know, this, this question. And I think the idea is to individualize, just, to, you know, to remind everyone, you know, you need to start on treatment, low dose, you know, and optimize. And just don't worry about low systolic BP as long as the patient is not is asymptomatic and it doesn't cause any other end organ perfusion, then you can continue with the treatment, you know, in terms of heart failure treatment. So um, role of ACE inhibitor and ARB in combination, do you use that straight? Yeah, no, right? No, I think, yeah, I think no. straightforward, no, really. 
you know it's yeah. quite dangerous for patient i think risk of hyperkalemia risk of uh, risk of hypotension uh, and there mm. is no role and especially in heart failure so how about stopping RNA, you know, once LVEF is improved? Okay, so this is what we call heart failure with recovered e ejection mm -hmm. fraction, right? Yeah, which I didn't talk about and uh, some people hardly talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it's very tempting. We do see patients, young patients coming in, those with myocarditis and so on. Uh, before the advent of RNA, we use ACE inhibitors, obviously, and things like that. They, they improve. And uh, you know, the EF is normal and things like that. And uh, you know, young guys, they said you do, do, do not want to take any medications. Yep. Uh, my advice is to continue on because the real I find the relapse rates in this group of patients uh, for me uh, are pretty high. So they do yep. relapse if you stop. So what, what do you think that took? Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think majority of the patients that we have seen with heart failure with recovered ejection fraction is actually young men uh, who has dilated cardiomyopathy, maybe due to hypertensive cardiomyopathy. You know, and when you treat their, you know, their, their, their blood pressure, they are in their own proper anti-failure treatment, they improve the LV functions recovered. There is a category of this recovered. However, when we look at heart failure with recovered ejection fraction, we treat them as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We don't treat them as heart failure with preserve. They don't go into heart failure preserve, even though that their ejection fraction is more than 50%. I don't stop, unfortunately. Of course, you can stop the diuretics if they're asymptomatic. You may be able to cut down on their RAS blood or their MRA, the spinal lectern a little bit, but I will keep on their RAS blocker, for example, ARNI. I will continue on beta blockers and I will also continue on SGLT2 inhibitor plus a little bit of MRA. So I will not yeah. stop them because as Dr. Sri mentioned, um, and so in my experience, so there are some patients who have relapsed and then when you have relapsed, when you stop them, then, you know, then you will, you know, definitely know that they should not be off this medication, unfortunately. And some of them don't respond as well, you know, the second time. So mm. that is the worry. It's like you got one chance and you stopped it. Uh, you know, I think it's lifelong beta blockers and uh, until we know more or better in the future, yep. uh, ACE or ARNI, whatever you say, is lifelong in this group of patients. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think, you know, we, we kind of finished, you know, the, the questions from the audience, but Sri, what do you think about, you know, about the advanced heart failure treatment currently? I think, you know, the availability of it, you know, in terms of transplant, you, how willing is everyone in the, you know, in the Ministry of Health Hospital or other hospitals willing to refer patients for transplant? Actually, I think it is education. I think, uh, okay, number one, I think IGN has to do, at the moment, uh, IGN is the only center looking at advanced uh, heart failure treatment and so on. Uh, there is talk for, you know, Sadang in the future also to augment this role yep. uh, by many. But, uh, I'll, but here I'll be frank. Personally, I think you need one center to, to yep. you know, uh, augment or, you know, uh, concentrate on this so they become very, very good and better. Because like, you know, for heart transplant, we are still not doing enough. Yeah. Over the years so far, we've done 26 heart transplants all in IGN so far. So if you if you do not have volume, you won't get better. So you need one center to get better, do more and more. But subsequently, you do need other sister uh, centers and so on. Yeah. And I think uh, one way is to educate us, like, you know, like Intermax and so on, not many people know about this, yeah. uh, even classification and so on, LVETS, what you can do. I think, I know, and then uh, when we see this, uh, and especially physicians, even cardiology, other cardiology centers do not have advanced heart failure, things like that, because we are still away from what we call a shock center. Yep. Our management of shock and so on is still uh, quite dismal. And in fact, we're looking at future uh, cardiologists to, to actually uh, subspecialize in critical care cardiology, heart failure cardiology. We're looking into that. ECMO. Yep. I think we have to use it more. So this is, I think we, we there's a lot more we need to do. Yep. And uh, heart transplant is, uh, I, I think it's more of a continuous education. At one point, there was a lot of uh, awareness and a lot of people started to refer, yep. uh, even for donors and so on. But I think it's died down now. And uh, now we have LVET also, it's not cheap. Yep. Uh, uh, so these are the things. I think they, you need more education, not of the patients, but also the doctors so they get yep. more referrals. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think, thank you, sir. I think, well, you know, well said, really. I think, you know, as a tertiary centers like us, I think, you know, Serdang, IGN, you know, we, we look after patients who have advanced heart failure therapy. However, you know, in our setting as well, you know, Dr. Sri has mentioned that the multidisciplinary uh, heart failure clinic, it is also essential, isn't it? 
So, you know, I think, you know, we, we don't forget about treating patients, you know, at that level in terms of, you know, treating them, you know, as uh, advised lifestyle changes, you know, low salt diet, you know, for fluid restriction, you know, exercise, graduated exercise for patients with heart failure. And we also emphasize on the four pillars of the treatment, as, I, as Dr. Sri Aranga has mentioned, uh, and device therapy, and also advanced heart failure therapy. So in IJN, as what Dr. Sri has mentioned, we do have um, you know, we have ECMO, we do have left ventricular assist device, LVAD, we have transplant, uh, and we also embark in patients with mitral clip for functional MR, you know, also, I think these are the things that we have. And I do have some, you know, experience, increasing experience with using tafamidis uh, in patients with cardiac amyloid. So I think these are the interesting, you know, um, development in patients with heart failure. So, I think yeah. uh, to add on, genetics is also important. Yes. I think we have, to, uh, we have to work together with geneticists and so on. In fact, during our My Life, uh, the Genetic uh, Society and so on, they're having a two-day meeting, which I'm planning to join, uh, to see how to diagnose more. There's something we're missing out. And uh, the, the other thing is, I think uh, group learning is always better. So yeah. hopefully we can have more collaboration with IGN, to, you know, with uh, Sedang and so on, to look into this group of patients. And uh, I, I, I think I, I echo whatever, whatever you said. Yeah. Because uh, advanced heart failure is very expensive. The other one we should get into is uh, palliative care. Yep. We have to get our palliative specialist to work with us as a team. Uh, this is something we really need to look into. Okay, so Sri, I think, you know, last word, it's four o'clock. So anything last word from you before we end the session? <laughs> last word. I think uh, heart failure is very exciting and uh, it cuts across uh, all disciplines. I didn't even talk about pregnancy and, and so on. And I think you have to look closely at the guidelines and uh, optimize our patients in whatever way we can. There's always help available. There are cardiac centers in uh, all the KKM cardiac centers, IGN and so on. You can always call me or, uh, you know, that to ask me, we can, I, I can point you in the right direction of what to do and so on. So I think that is very important to, to, get, to, to give the best for the patient. And the guidelines also show that you have to do a lot of thinking. It's yep. just not adding the medication and so on. You have to follow up. You have to uh, titrate and so on. So there's a lot of work for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sri. I think an excellent talk. I think, you know, just the last word for me, I think, you know, first of all, you have to, when you treat patients with heart failure, you know, lifestyle is important. And as I mentioned, number two is think about their medical therapy. You know, the four pillars is what Dr. Sri Ranga has mentioned. You know, you do, you will have challenges with regards to hypotension, with CKD, you know, patients with diabetic, multiple comorbidities, but you need to tackle them separately, individualize them. You need to think about device therapy. You also need to, to think about advanced heart failure therapy. So I think, and, you know, and we are fortunate that we have all this available in Malaysia. And I think, you know, just don't forget that, you know, so, you know, and when you treat heart failure patients, treat them as a whole, you know, so it is very, very important, you know, because, you know, rather than leaving them towards the end, you know, and then go into palliative care. And I think with that, I think no more questions. I think, thank you very much, Dr. Asuranga. So I think, hope to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dato. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asri. Thank you, Dr. Asri. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us as well. So uh, please don't forget to join us again next Thursday. The uh, topic will be on uh, cardiac imaging. Uh, there, will be, uh, there will be no QR code for today for the CPD point. Uh, we will key in the participation for each of you. Uh. So thanks again, Dr. Asri and uh, Dato Asri for such an excellent webinar. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.